Thank you very much for your introduction. It's for me a great honor to be here this morning. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, the spectacular fall of the communist regimes in 1989 boosted our faith in ourselves. We saw that liberal democracy was morally superior to communist dictatorships. We saw that our freedom was infinitely more efficient in creating wealth and promoting development and prosperity to all citizens. Many of us in the West who were interested in politics thought then that the victory of liberal democracy and the defeat of communism was going to have two positive effects. On the one hand, it would be an effective vaccine against any totalitarian or collectivist temptation. And at the same time, it would serve to stir the free world away from the social democratic paradigm that had been dominating since the end of the Second World War. However, ladies and gentlemen, the experience of the past 25 years, and above all of these last years, shows that our hopes and expectations were over-optimistic. The fact is that totalitarian temptations are still present amongst us, and the acceptance of liberal policies continues to encounter enormous difficulties. And why is this so? This is not an easy question, but allow me to outline some possible explanations. In the first place, the virus of totalitarianism has shown a special skill of mutating, for mutating and emerging under different disguises in Spain, in Europe, and in other countries in the world. Islamic fundamentalism, it has been said, is one of these mutations. Another mutation of totalitarianism is populism that is succeeding in some Latin American countries such as Venezuela, Ecuador, or Bolivia. These populist regimes do not conceal their close relationship with the communist dictatorship of the Castro brothers in Cuba. And this populism has emerged in Spain recently, in the last European elections, with a new party that mixes Venezuela's Bolivarian populism with Marxist ideology. It obtained five seats in the European Parliament. But in addition to this ability of the totalitarian virus to mutate, I think there is another very important reason to explain why the West has gone soft in this past 25 years. And the reason lies, in my opinion, in the educational systems in most Western countries. From 1996 to 1999, under the Prime Minister Adnar, I was the Minister of Education. So I have a first-hand experience of the violence with which the ideological establishment opposed any reform to the dogmas now dominating our educational system. These dogmas are not very different from those dominating education in almost Western countries. Maybe we should mention those countries in the Germanic area, Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, as exceptions to the rule of the dominating education system in other countries. In my view, these educational dogmas are responsible for the fact that we in the West do not defend as we should the values that have ensured our freedom and our prosperity. I refer to the values that Professor Niall Ferguson has studied so well in his book, The Great Degeneration, a book which I suppose most of us have read. In the 1960s, two ideologies emerged in Western school system and proved lethal to the education of responsible citizens committed to defending Western values. One was the ideology that comes from the revolution of 68. The 68ism ideology 
originated in the student-occupied La Sorbonne in May 1968. That 68ism has become more strongly established in our schools than one could imagine. The reaction against some excesses of authoritarianism in schools turned out into a reaction against autoritas, against the autoritas of knowledge. And as a result, in our schools, in many schools in the West, in the Western countries, there is little difference between knowing and not knowing, learning and not learning, teaching and not teaching. And the other dominant ideology in our school is the egalitarianism that permeates socialist thinking. I think that British people will have no difficulty understanding what I'm talking about, because it was the Minister of Education with Harold Wilson in 1965, the socialist Anthony Crossland, the first to embrace this theory. Crossland viewed schools as a source of inequality. And that led him to confuse equal opportunities, which in my opinion must be the main objective of any government, with equality of results. Crossland, as many of you know, was the great promoter of the comprehensive schools and the great enemy of the grammar schools that Mrs. Thatcher liked so much. With this, I think you all understand uh, what this ideology was about. And the experience of nearly half a century of comprehensiveness is that students' results have evened out, but at a below average level. And ladies and gentlemen, to sum up, I would say yes to the panel's question. Has the West gone soft? Indeed, the West has not defended with the necessary energy the principles and values that 25 years ago led to the defeat of the communi communism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that one of the reasons for not defending properly the essential values of the free world lies in the ideologies that dominate our schools and our educational community. These ideologies turn our teaching into something that is falsely egalitarian. Furthermore, they disregard the transmission of knowledge that is the greatest asset of the Western civilization. And for this reason, any political project that seeks to recover a Western initiative in the world will necessarily have to undertake an in-depth review of the current teaching system. Before ending, I want to congratulate the Center of Political Studies for, this, for achieving this incredible conference and, of course, our sponsors. Thank you for your attention.